Good morning, everybody out there, except people who uh, enjoy tea instead of coffee. But for the rest of you guys, we are back in this Monday morning, which means we are diving back into the business of fantasy football. Haymaker after haymaker. A lot of big names so far. Uh, I've given us a ton of value. And as you can see across the, the way from me, we have Roto Pat, Pat Darty of Roto Worlds to talk about everything behind the scenes of fantasy football. There will be no player analysis. If you've joined us thus far, it's nothing to actually do with players or NFL or anything in that sense. It's all behind the scenes in terms of, of branding, personal branding, the companies, the advertising, the revenue, right? That's, that's what we're concerned about. And that's what we're here to talk about. We are welcoming in one of my, you know, Pat, low key, this is, this might be a hot take for you, but I actually, I personally think that you are probably the funniest podcaster in the fantasy football space. <laughs> it's definitely a hot take. Uh, it's a, on the whole, an extremely funny industry. I won't, I won't lie. I mean, I try to be funny, uh, probably too hard, probably too much. It's like kind of like my number one obsession. So I definitely try to be funny. Um, you have a very, uh, you have a very dry sense of humor, which I, I really appreciate. And like, I, I really enjoy listening to you as a podcaster because I wasn't sure if you actually like I, you, you come off very witty. And I think that's a big part of being a good podcaster. But I could tell, you know, you come in with a lot of like ready to go jokes and they're very like dry and you're ready to fucking like fire them off. They get me excited. But I just wanted to throw it out there and start it off with um, you are someone that I very much enjoy listening to. You are a part of the Roto World team, which is one of the bigger brands in the industry that has been growing rapidly. Um, so I'm excited to have you and welcome. Welcome to the headquarters. Welcome to the business of fantasy football. It's my pleasure. And thank you for the like huge ego boost. And uh, <laughs> sometimes the pod, yeah, I come in with a few pre-planned jokes at the very beginning. I didn't do that today. Uh, so now it's going to have to be all riff based if I'm going to be funny today, which I, mean, I love riffing. So but, we'll uh, see how good you really are. Yeah, exactly. And especially now that you just like inflated my ego. No, like, just do you. Times 1000%. Maybe I'm just going to be too arrogant to be funny now. But uh, Are you I'll drinking try. tea or coffee? I... Uh, First off, I knew we'd be friends from the intro because uh, I don't think I've ever even drank tea. Um, <laughs> it's a hundred percent coffee. Now I do put cream in my in my my coffee, which gets me canceled in some quarters. I don't do sugar. Not only do I do cream, sometimes I do skim milk. Um, that's like a big time canceling for some people. I really. But, uh, the yeah. other thing I really appreciate about your humor is that you you love to throw in like these buzzwords that are very popular in, uh, in the millennial <laughs> age range. Like, I might I get too know. obsessed with those jokes. Yes. Josh got mad at me last year for making probably an average of two to three canceled jokes per pod. So <laughs> that's funny that you noticed that. That is uh, 1 million percent something I do. So uh, yeah, I like the internet buzzwords. I'm a huge fan of that. My, my roommate all last year, he used the word like canceled nonstop. And I was just like, stop saying that. And then before I knew it, like six months in, I couldn't stop saying it. And I hear you saying it. I'm like, there, there goes that man. All right, let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk some real stuff now. So you are pretty well known within the industry. It, it is a, an industry where once you get your name out there, in a sense, you kind of stay atop the bubble and you work at Roto World, which is one of the bigger brands, if not like the biggest brand overall in terms of like a company right now in the space. I'm curious as to your path to get to where you are as a writer for Roto World. Like, how long have you been there? Were you someone that went to school for like journalism? Were you someone that, you know, just started your own blog and kind of crept your way up? How did that, how did that go about? Well, first off, I've been here shockingly long at this point. I was just saying, I've been here nine years, which is like actually stunning to me, like, especially in this industry. Roto World's a great place to work for. They're good people to work for. So, how did I get here? I mean, a little bit of luck. You know, a little bit of hard work. It's kind of like all happen, not all happenstance, but you know, it's like the right combination of like hard work and happenstance, I guess. I did go to school for journalism. I went to University of Missouri Journalism School. Didn't write about sports at all in college, but like I was preparing for this job like my entire life, basically. Like I am like like kind of like a sickeningly large sports fan, not just like the four major sports, but I'm like, I'm like one of those people, like when the Olympics start, like I watch like every event, uh, <laughs> like I binge soccer. I, I watch like the big golf tournaments. I'm obsessed with tennis. I just like am obsessed with sports and like was my whole life. And also like obsessed with statistics. I'm not like a numbers guy, but I was always like obsessed with like stats and like knowing everyone's stats and all that. So just just a sports junkie, someone who liked to write and then went to school for it, replied to a Craigslist ad for the company. Like they didn't even list the company. Uh, <laughs> like it was like I graduated in May. I, I had no idea what I was going to do. 
like I, even though so in college I worked a lot for the school newspapers but I always did more like arts and entertainment but when it came time to like actually get serious I knew that I wanted to do sports it's like February March and I started applying for jobs and yeah I just replied to this Craigslist ad where it didn't even list the company and it turned out to be the original incarnation of Fanball, which I had never heard of, uh, was based in St. Louis. I got a job doing blurbs. Then they went out of business after 18 months uh, and I had been there. They like liquidated us. So I was there for like the worst 18 months in Fanball history, uh, <laughs> but it was a good company. I learned like the ropes very quickly. And so like, that's kind of like the hard work part. But then like the happenstance was through a friend of a friend of a friend, uh, I was in a fantasy base, fantasy baseball league with Evan Silva, who was also from St. Louis, but was not in St. Louis anymore at that time. And he was literally a friend of a friend of a friend. And I knew Evan and I loved Road World. You know, I was like obsessed with Road World. My company's gone out of business. I shot him a note. They happened to need a blurber at the time. And like the rest is history. So like I, I prepared to try to get into like this industry to do something like this. But you know, if I hadn't, had that like connection, quote unquote, I mean, I have no idea how my career would have gone. So like, I'd like to think, you know, it's like a lot because of like, I worked hard and did the right things, but I mean, I got very lucky too. Yeah. I think um, anyone who is successful in a sense always has that feeling of luck, right? In your sense, it was, you had the connection or whatever you had been writing. It was the right place, right time. And I feel like that's the same for any podcast that probably was successful in this space was like, oh, I got lucky because I started podcasting early. They're like me in a sense, right? Like I, I have pretty good numbers on YouTube, not nothing crazy, but I, in a sense, like I was one of the earlier people on YouTube. So I'm like, okay, I'm lucky that I got on YouTube, but I would never take away the fact that in order to get to that level, like it, it takes so much more than just luck. Like it's so much hard work and so much consistency to get to that level. Yeah. I mean, there's probably an element of like creating your own luck, obviously. And I believe hopefully, that a hundred percent. Yeah. Like you, you create hopefully, your own if I, hopefully if I hadn't gotten that big break with Evan and Rotor World, you know, something else would have come down the line soon after. But I mean, there's a chance it wouldn't have, but uh, yeah, I did. So I did put myself in position to try to land something like this. And then it was kind of just in the right place at the right time, you know, like the right place being my company going out of business, like, which is, you know, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. but like yeah. if my company had gone out of business like three months later and Rotor World wasn't looking for a writer, time maybe I would have packed up shop and gotten a quote-unquote normal job I mean who knows but yeah I mean you're 100% right I mean we're all lucky in some in some sense but if you if you really are working hard you know grinding uh, you will create some of your own luck yeah I mean like at the end of the day you're you're giving yourself everyone can get an at-bat right like being lucky is getting an at-bat but the the harder you work the more at-bats you give yourself to you know hit that home run or whatever so that's a great metaphor for it yeah there we go. There, there goes that man again. So <laughs> shout out to, to Fanball for going under. We would not have enough cancellation jokes in the fantasy industry had it not been for <laughs> going under. But let's, let's talk about Roto World because I'm actually fascinated by, and sorry, if I'm taking any, any, too many shots at your former employees or your current employees, just let me know. Okay, because I don't really care. I'll probably leave it in either way. But Roto World. So Roto World is, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but they are basically a subsidiary or a company owned by NBC Sports, correct? Correct. And it's not really, I wouldn't say it's a subsidiary at this point. It's like fully integrated. When I go to Stamford, Connecticut, which is where NBC Sports is based, we're just like in uh, like the writer, we're just like in a big newsroom with like the rest of like NBC Sports properties. So yeah, I mean, it was an independent website to like 2005, 2006, but it is now like a core NBC Sports digital property. So it's not like it's not like a, a business like NBC is managing. Like at, the, mm. at this point, it just like it is NBC essentially. Okay, I'll be honest. I kind of I throw the word subsidiary out there pretty often, and I'm not exactly sure that <laughs> what it technically means. So I just figured to be like, yeah, they're like a business that operates under another business. So that makes sense. So I mean, you're in Missouri, right? You said I am. Yes, and, St. Louis. So you work remotely most of the time. I I do, and. Throughout most of our history, it's been like a fully remote, uh, like workforce. Still, the vast majority of the the workforce is remote. But you know, NBC kind of like everyone else has gotten the video bug uh, the past year or two. So now, Josh Norris was the only one who was always permanently based there. He's been there a long time. But late like, last summer, uh, Ian Harditz and John Daigle. Uh, John was already working for Auto World. Ian wasn't. But both uh, made the move to Stanford, and now we have like three. We have a number of permanent employees there. You know, kind of like behind the scenes people, obviously, but like the writers is still this large majority is remote, but we do now for like the first time kind of have like an in the office presence uh, amongst the writers. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, makeup. I had Mike Tagliere on, on last week 
And we talked about fantasy pros and the makeup that they have within their company. And they work completely remote. I think he said they had 39 full-time writers all working remote. And that's a very, it's crazy how the world has shifted to a a norm where companies can feel comfortable, you know, scaling without ever being physically together. For the most part, you're still going to see a lot of pushback, I think, from traditional people who have built their businesses and they want to be physically together. I want to kind of break down that dichotomy in your opinion. Do you think you know, you work remote for the most time, but when you are in Sanford and you're around your other colleagues, I guess my question is, do you, do you think you're a better worker? Do you think you're more productive? Like, do you think there's a real source of energy when you guys are there together and better work gets created out of you? It's well, there's, there really is like no substitute for like in person on like videos or even podcasts. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously many of the most successful podcasts in America, especially in fantasy podcasts, involve people who are not in the same room. There's kind of no substitute for like in-person community. You know, it's being able to take like physical cues from people. You know, the conversation just flows differently. I don't even necessarily know if it's better, I guess. It's just different and more natural, obviously. My thought, I think I'll thought of a lot of remote people when they go into the office though, like we say this to people at the office, I guess when you get used to working alone, like I'm just alone in my office all day, uh, then you go in like this big, you know, chaotic newsroom with like, and I'm like, how do, how would I ever get any work done here? So it's almost like the reverse, like uh, for me, I've gotten so used to working on my own. It's like a real big culture shock, you know, when I go to like a normal office, clearly they get a ton of work done, but it's just very different when you get used to, uh, it's, it's almost like you become like a tennis player. Like I can't have like anyone talking when I'm serving ever, you know, when I'm writing and <laughs> but clearly human beings can get a lot of work done uh, amongst that kind of environment. I just, I'm so far removed from it at this point that when I go there, I'm like, wow, I don't know if I could write in this room. It's weird for me because I think uh, I, I've been working basically from home for almost three years now. And I'm a super independent person. Like I love working on my own. But one of the very first things I realized when I stopped working at an actual place where there was other employees, I was like, this is really lonely. And I was like, this is not something I expected to happen to me because I'm like, you know, I have friends that I can go out with and do whatever. But when I'm home all day, every day, like by myself, that was not something that I expected to happen. So now when I do get around other creative people, I feel this energy and I feel this you know, maybe in a sense, like the nuance of how you work in terms of just like writing, you know, you're, you're like a blogger for the most part that can be distracting. But even like during my days when I, when I know I'm not filming something and I don't need to be like in my apartment at my setup, I try to go to, you know, to coffee shops where I know other people are working and there is that like little bit of creative energy. So that's kind of what I was getting at. And I think it's, yeah, you know, it's more efficient for a company to have people that are working remotely, of course, but I do think there's an aspect from both sides that I have not fully like unlocked yet, but I think that's where I was kind of going, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, I'm like a very like gregarious, like talking, I'm like, I'm like an elite small talker. So like, <laughs> I like, did well in an office environment. So like, it was, it was a big change for me. Like, yeah, when you work from home, like I like look, you have to like look for reasons to like leave the house. Like I create like Wednesday is like coffee shop day for me. And, uh, <laughs> I've kind of found, because my old, at Fanball, I kind of had this mix. And to me, what is probably the ideal is probably like three or four days a week in an office and one or two days a week at home. And obviously, I've gotten used to working from home. I'm good at my job from home. A mix that, that might be where we're headed. And like, you know, a lot of people, even now, like when it's not, you're not required to be remote, lots of people now, we have employees in New York who don't even work going to the office every day. And to me, the hybrid is probably kind of the best, you know, just for a variety of reasons, for a variety of obvious reasons. Yeah, I, I've, I think I've settled on my answer to that is like three or four days in the office, one or two days a week at home is like maybe like the perfect mix. And very few people are ever going to get that. But like if I could like design the American economy, that's the way I would design it. Well, I think it's very, I think it should be the leader's job or the boss's job. If you as a company or a boss or something, you have the power to the power to empower people to do, you know, work how they want. I think that's a sign of a good leader is being able to understand how people work best. Like if someone is the boss at Roto World and they, they're like, Pat works best, you know, three days a week in the office, two days a week at home, let's let them do that. And I think that's the, I, I feel like, you know, you look at almost anything in the world today and everything is becoming more and more personalized, whether it's products, whether, you know, whatever it is. And the more personalized you can make any experience, like if it is in the office, if it is buying something, the better it's going to work out. So I, I feel like that's the way I'm kind of seeing the workforce going. And I think the most successful companies are going to be able to kind of forge that into their plan when it comes to like the schedule of being remote or in the office. 
Yeah, I don't even have anything to add to that because that was like literally a perfect answer. I don't think I could have given a better spiel on that. I think we are like probably slowly like moving towards that model because yeah, I mean, I, lots of my friends in St. Louis, they don't go in five days a week. It's just, you know, it's an easy way to get burned out, especially like St. Louis, there's not mm-hmm. good public transportation. You're just driving in traffic all the time. And I think we are slowly uh, headed in that like utopian direction that you just laid out. Yeah, I mean, people on Twitter are just going to complain and complain and complain <laughs> yes, until, until we have a perf- until we have a perfect world. Like that's yes, that's really the way the world is working. It's crazy. <laughs> All right. So at Roto World, right? So you have the you have this physical office and I've seen some of the videos that you guys put up. You're a blogger at heart. You're a writer at heart. But obviously you guys have to diversify the content and you guys have the podcast and you guys put out video content. And I'm curious from someone who came from like the blogging background, is writing still your favorite type of content to put out? It is like I do love to write, but like truth be told, my favorite type of content to put out is basically, I mean, I'm just kind of shame. I, I really, like, I really enjoy making people laugh or like trying to be clever and, you know, failing most of the time. But so like, that's something where I can do that for, through writing. I can do that through podcasting and I can do that through video. So I kind of like just view that almost as like another medium or another challenge where I get to do, obviously I want to, I want to be informative of course, but I love trying to be like a lively entertaining presence without being, you know, like obnoxious or overbearing. So I kind of almost, it's almost like an extension of that for me, where it's just like another way where I can kind of try to get to do what I love most. But now if I had to pick a medium, it, it would be writing. Uh, I just, I love to write. I, mean, I love podcasting and I do actually love doing the videos too, despite very much being a blogger at heart. Okay. So it's not, not so much the medium, it's more of the message is what you're saying yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly you're good at this podcasting thing uh <laughs> you're condensing the message very in an elite fashion thank you thank you I, I i also appreciate you i i'm a big fan of like the word elite just like <laughs> saying things are elite and you've thrown it out like two or three times already and it's got if i replay when i go back and edit this i'm gonna watch you say elite and then immediately i'm gonna start laughing on the other side it's one of my words of the day yeah so you keep throwing that out there and you'll keep getting laughs from my side all right so so uh the point i actually was getting at was that when I, i've seen the videos at roto world and you guys have like a professional setup it's like you guys are sitting around you know a very professional whether it's like couches or chairs or whatever it is with like very good camera setup i'm assuming a lot of that stems from the fact that you guys are underneath nbc sports so you don't really have to learn a lot from yourselves you have people in the production side of things that like tell you exactly how to do so the first time you went on on professional video set like that what do you remember it um I, yes i do i do were, were you nervous I honestly, it was like the only time I was ever nervous. It was a live draft. I think the summer of 2017, like we were doing like a live promotional draft. I think I actually remember this. Yeah. And like the very first minute, I like honestly almost like I wasn't having like a panic attack or anything, but I was just very nervous. And I was in the middle of like a long spiel and just completely forgot what I was talking about. (laughs) And like, it was maybe not as obvious as I thought, but it seemed like very obvious to me. But I saved myself and the podcast by, you know, just acknowledging that I had gotten very nervous and confused and lost. And thankfully that uh, moment of levity, like brought me back to like the sane world. And ever since I do not, I have no idea, there's still things I get very nervous for. For some reason I get very nervous going on radio because there's never really an agenda And like, they always want to have like a really hyper focus on like whatever local market they're in. So for some reason, like radio still makes me very nervous, but like that stuff at NBC, I don't know why it just doesn't make me nervous at all. That's interesting. I I went on uh, over at the fantasy sports network. They have their studio in Manhattan and Frank Stample invited me to come on. I've been on a few times now, but I remember the first time they invited me, you know, it's in the middle of Manhattan. So I'm like, wow, this is like really official. I'm just like a kid that, you know, <laughs> not just in like, Brooklyn anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like a kid that did YouTube in, in his apartment or whatever. So I get there and I was like, oh my God, they have like a legit studio with the cameras and all this lighting. And the first, you know, the lights went on and you hear in the microphone, it's like three, two, one, you're on. And I'm like, the reason I started doing videos because I, I don't like writing. That's not my app, my preferred avenue to get my message across. I'm way more comfortable in front of a camera. I don't know why. Just That's just the way I, I'm wired. But I was definitely nervous the first time or two that I did that. So when I saw the professional setup from you guys, like for the most part, I mean, you guys are not entertainment personalities at heart. No. Like, you guys are like for, like journalists, like writers. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious how it came across to like other people, you know? 
I don't know. It's weird. I think one of the reasons I'm not nervous, it's almost like there's like a sense of like unreality about it. So <laughs> yeah. like you're like so far removed from like your normalcy that somehow that's like calming. Um, I mean, the standards are very low or much lower uh, for putting fantasy people on camera. But like, so like we share, like we literally have like a dressing room when we're there, like by like the football night in America people by like the premier league people. Like I've seen like Re- Rebecca Lowe and all the Robbies like in the back and like the talent area. It's so, like, we get lumped in with them, but like we get like a dressing room, but like, they're not really worried understandably. So about getting us like caked in makeup or whatever, you know, Do they put so, like, makeup on you. Uh, very rarely but yes i have I've been put in makeup before oh and i cannot God. figure out what to do with my hair uh so like um i'm gonna have to have them start doing my hair or something soon um but yeah they there's like an uh, there's like an understanding amongst us and them like you know what we're the fantasy people it's all right we're not going to be as good looking as kyle martino uh we're just gonna go out there <laughs> and do our thing they make a little effort but yeah we understand like we completely agree with this we are not treated like mike tarico would be or like rodney harrison would be yeah i mean i i, I can't say i necessarily <laughs> yeah blame it them. makes sense it makes <laughs> yeah. perfect sense do you ever wish that like in a sense it was more laid back because when I, mean, I started doing videos i was I, you know i was living in my mom's house i was just doing it in my bedroom and if you go back a couple of years you'll see my like a bunch of my first few videos i literally had like my laundry basket in the background. And it was when you came onto my <laughs> channel and saw my stuff, it was like, oh, this is just like a kid. I'm just talking to a normal human being. As I've developed and the production quality has obviously taken a little bit of a step up. I never want to get to the point where, and this is not necessarily like a, a bad thing for these bigger studios because they have a lot of money to put in production quality, but I never want to get to the point where people feel like they're watching me and they're in a studio. Like I want them to feel like, what is that like candy wrapper doing in the background? Like that is, <laughs> that's my, those are my favorite comments that I get on my YouTube thing. So it's like, if you had your preference, do you, do you kind of wish that it was a little bit more laid back? Well, it's definitely more laid back than you think. Uh, okay. Like it can be like a bit of a shotgun type thing sometimes. And to me, the laid back feeling though, it doesn't really come me. I understand your point like big time, but like for me, it doesn't really come from the environment so much as like the people you're laid back. Like I've done so many things now with Josh Norris and now with John Daigle and like Ian Hart. It's like, that's where like the laid back really comes from for me. It's just like the familiarity and like the rapport with the people more than like the literal bright lights or like the like the makeup which again not every time but i have i have been put in makeup you're, and, you're a big uh, makeup guy it's yeah okay. i'm a bit i'm wearing it right now uh <laughs> it's like that stuff doesn't when i think of laid back i think more i'm just more worried about like how the conversation is going to go the trappings of like, the studio don't really i don't even really think about it to be honest Okay. Maybe that, yeah. Maybe that was just a big thing for me. Cause I know, I guess. No, I'm, yeah. I mean, everyone, everyone's different. So yeah. Uh, to me, it's, I'm more worried. Yeah. About like the conversation and the people like, cause hopefully like we're on the same page. This is going to flow well, that kind of thing. You know, it's funny right before we got on your last name can be a little bit intimidating in terms of how to properly announce it. So I'm going back and I'm like, I, I thought I had it correct. And I'm going back, literally, I had the Roto World podcast pulled up on my phone and I'm going back and I'm like, okay, let's just find a podcast where Josh Norris introduces him and then we could put this to rest. But I had to go back to like week 12 waivers or something. The first 20 seconds were actually you yelling at him about him getting your <laughs> last name wrong. And you were like, and this was like 10 minutes before we started recording this. It's like, just say D-A-R-D-E-E really fast, darty. And that's how you say it. And I was like, really, really proud of myself when we first said it. The point I'm getting at is you guys have very good chemistry. Like you worry about how the conversation is going to flow. And this is something that I've never seen a problem with on Roto World. It is, it is something I see not necessarily a problem with, but there are a lot of podcasts in, in fantasy that force chemistry in a sense, like, yes. uh, you know, they'll, they'll give informational value and it'll come off. Right. But some people probably need to, uh, work on their communication skills a little bit, even if they are comfortable with the person, you know, they get to, yeah. they, they put this, like this on a pedestal and they don't, they don't listen to the person. They're not able to kind of weave their way throughout the conversation. And it's definitely a problem within our space a little bit, I think, but you guys have done it well and you guys have built a really good chemistry from i guess you guys have been working together for a, a long time now right like you and josh you said six six or so years Yeah, i've been podcasting with josh at least five or six years and yeah I me mean, to like the everlasting frustration of like analytics people which is almost all of us at this <laughs> point like chemistry you still can't really like teach or force like you said it just kind of it's either there or it's not and thankfully we have had it um 
it's so funny. That's uh, the name thing too. Uh, we, I have podcasted with Josh many times since then, and he has since he's regressed. He can't, he's still not. <laughs> he's regressed. Right. Just yesterday he said Doherty and say, I don't usually correct people because it's really hard to pronounce, but you know, when it's my guy, Josh, who I do it with every week, like he is someone I will get on about it. But like you, like, I don't expect you out of. You also like Doherty. when you said it that way, D A R dar d e e like just say it like that really fast yes. already like there you go that's it's yes. really it easy phonetically yes yes it's okay. very intimidating and my family kind of settled on like there's so many different pronunciations of darty amongst the irish diaspora in america and we for whatever reason settled on like the most difficult one if you say it phonetically you'll never forget it okay i i have it down pat and somehow down <laughs> roto pat and somehow your, your boy josh does not does not have it going yeah. so something some synapse in his brain doesn't fire <laughs> All right. Well, he does the rest of his job very well. He um, does. As the, one as, as the rest of the Roto World squad does. Now, I want to, I want to talk about Evan Silva. And I want to talk about this from uh, not, not necessarily Evan as a person, but from what this did to Roto World as a company when he departed, right? So almost everyone listening to this, I'm sure, knows that Evan Silva worked at Roto World for a very long time. He left and started his own thing, established the run. It's and established. It is absolutely uh, – it, it, his company is probably more established than the actual run in the NFL at this point. So yes, Evan, has, it Evan is. has pivoted over and uh, has done a great job you know, building up that brand. But what I think is so interesting about what happened in that whole debacle – or not debacle, but just, just in that move is Evan was such a powerful – he's such you – know, he's like the biggest name in fantasy almost he outside is. of like a, a Matt Berry. You know? for, for the mainstream, it's Matt Berry. For people who like really follow fantasy, Evan's probably the biggest guy there. So as Roto World has been built up, there's obviously a lot of key players like yourself and the other guys there that do a fantastic job. But Evan is you know, by far and away the biggest personal brand there. So when he – decides to leave it makes a lasting impression on you know what's going to happen going forward in that sense now we talked about how you know NBC Sports and Roto World are one in the same now and they operate the same NBC is a gigantic company so I'm curious you know you talk about how you're in these changing rooms near all these like big athletes and they just look at you guys as the fantasy guys but with a guy like Evan who is a big player within this space when he you know goes into the boss's office says he's gonna leave does NBC I'm not really sure how much you know about this on like the executive level but like the people at NBC look at this and are like oh shit like this is a really big deal for Roto World they did yeah and like you know we're, we're not under any illusions we still are like the fantasy ver Vertical, you know, we're not going to be mm -hmm. as important as like NFL, like you know, like actual NFL or whatever. But we are important uh, inside NBC Digital. Like we 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 feel very taken care of, like a big part of the team. But uh, there was a there was a big effort to keep Evan without getting too into it, and it was not acrimonious at all. But you know, Evan was Mister Roto World. Uh, to say he gave Roto World everything he had uh, would be putting it mildly. Like right. he's like a force of nature, like a freak of nature, and it was just really like the some cliches I mean, cliches are cliches because they're true and he was serious he was just ready for a new challenge like he just he was ready to strike out on his own and do his own thing and just see what happened he'd been with Roto world well over 10 years and they did everything they could to keep him this kind of became obvious toward the end it was just time for him to try to do his own thing Roto world goes on you know Roto world is great because it's like self-sufficient it's not a slight on evan at all obviously but like Roto world is going to go on regardless of evan it's, it's because of the work people like him and like greg rosenthal and chris wessling have done and turned it into such like a great trusted brand but so like Roto World goes on, but you don't replace Evan Silva. Like as you said, like he is the big dog. We really wanted to keep him, but you know, at the end of the day, everyone too respected his decision. And like it was just he wanted to do this, and uh, it's working out great for him. Yeah, and we touched on when some when someone leaves that kind of void there, someone else obviously has to pick it up if you're going to try and be as successful as you were previous to the move. And you guys, you know, have done it. You yourself and Josh have obviously had the chemistry, but. Ian coming on and those other players yes. coming on like the chemistry needed to be there from day one because if you guys had people that would yeah. listen to, to the Roto World podcast and then Evan's gone and then all of a sudden we have you know one or two new guys and it just sounds a little flunky like there's a good chance that you would lose those listeners so you yeah, it was a fateful moment for sure I, yeah I bet can you kind of like talk through the process of the first few times maybe from like your personal point of view you know how important those first few shows the first couple of weeks after Evan was gone and like building up the chemistry with these new players and just kind of what that experience was like for you 
Well, yeah, first off, replacing Evan has not been a one-man job. We basically like, put the great man theory to work. And we're like, so many things, like after Evan left, we're like, oh, that's just something that Evan always did because he's inexhaustible and never runs out of energy and works yeah. 24 <laughs> hours a day. Replacing Evan was not a one-person job and still hasn't been. And it sounds like the podcast and the chemistry, like I said earlier, like we try it, we hired good people and, and you hope it works out. And thankfully it did. There was no grand plan other than that, though, other than we're going to hire good people and, you know, try to make this work. And hopefully it did. And it did. So, yeah, I mean, there was no grand plan other than we, we're just going to hire good people and see what happens, basically. Because yeah. it was kind of shocking. You know, it was like near, we also lost Rich Rebar, you know. Rich was going to be like a big part of the post-Evan plan. We were kind of like, scram- like as much- scrambling is probably too, too big of a word for it. But, you know, it was kind of like. Uh, I mean, it, was, it was tough. Yeah, this is kind of we can hire good people and see what happens. And there's not much more we can do other than that. Okay, so the people that you ended up hiring after Evan, after Rich, the process for finding them, did you and Josh have input on that because you were going to be working with them? Yeah, absolutely. And like we hired Hayden and John, and we all already knew them because they had already been working for us part time. Hayden Winks and John Daigle, and Ian was just someone you know I recommended. I'm like, I'm going to ask this guy to interview. Thankfully, he was very interested in interviewing. And so you know, I actually, I get a finder's fee for Ian Artis. <laughs> uh, I wish that were true. But uh, I did, yeah, I, I asked Ian to apply. Thank, they did, they listened to me. Thank, like, I'm like, this guy is great. We all love him. Like he had to go through like the normal interview process or whatever. But thankfully what I saw, they saw too. And yeah, we got a great new employee out of it. So do you think that these guys that got hired were hired because they had built up a personal brand on their own? I don't know. I mean, like Ian, Ian did, but like John, like he had a brand, but you know, it's not like, it's not like John had a huge personal John got hired just cause he's great. And he's very, very good on camera too. So like, uh, I'm sure that played into it and like, he didn't have no social media following. Yeah. I mean, we were just truly just looking for people that could do the job and you know, it's nice if they have a, a social media following obviously Ian mm-hmm. already had a pretty big one um, but yeah that was not we would never just hire someone based on like the number of Twitter followers no no that's not really <laughs> what I meant either but <laughs> no I, think, I know yeah sorry I didn't even make mean make it sound like that's what you meant either but, no no yeah. it's cool I, I think um, there's like a broader point here I think it, it's interesting the way the world is working today especially with a publication like yours and i'm i i would love to talk to someone who works at espn or something like that because the hiring process has probably changed so rapidly within the last five years because you could probably have kids that come out of school really really well respected writing schools and they're looking for a fantasy football writer and you know they put a job posting out there and they're saying send in your resume send in a writing whatever and send us your socials or whatever and there's going to be a thousand kids that come out of columbia or cornell or wherever the good writing schools are and they're all going to be the same but there might be one kid who comes from a lower college but has a ma- and i don't mean like just like twitter followers as a raw number but as a master following you know a personal brand yeah. through yeah. twitter or social or whatever platform that he's done has and, a brand you know yeah exactly that like that is what is going to stand out in that line. Like everybody is, could be impressive as a writer, but the person who's built a brand is who's going to stand out in, in that sense. It's true. Yeah. It's a, it's a very like unique and like sometimes informal industry. Like yeah. I never even interviewed a Rotor world. I just started writing and like this had a job one day. <laughs> uh, we do do interviews now apparently. Um, but uh, yeah, like, it's like it's what you said. There's no, there's no, there's, there's nothing, there's no silver bullet you can put on your resume in this industry. Basically, it is really about the work you do. Like you said, the brand you're building, and it it's, feels cheesy and like kind of cynical almost to talk about brands. But I mean, it's a brand-based industry. We're an industry that's literally only based off content. Like our, our yes, only product, exactly. since content is the product, and the only way you deliver content is by talking to people or yelling at people or you know. <laughs> talking with people or whatever, you're, you're automatically building a brand within itself. So the way I look at personal brand is like, if you're going into a, uh, an industry where content is the face of it, which is the direction we're going for a lot of, a lot of industries now, right? Personal brand is, in my opinion, the biggest point of leverage that you could possibly give yourself in what's going to be the, the world in the next five or 10 years. And when we talk about Evan Silva, like his personal brand was, was so big. I'm actually really surprised. And I've, I've voiced this before. I was surprised that he waited this long to leave and start his own thing. I was surprised because when you have the brand of Evan Silva, when you have 150, 200,000 Twitter followers, you could leverage that to the point where you could basically do anything. And when you say 
you know, you guys tried very hard to keep him. I'm, I'm sure like the price that was offered to him was enormous. But since Evan has so much leverage on his side, like he was able to pull back and be like, you know, I, I'll do what I want because no matter what, like my personal brand will bring the money in that I couldn't get from you guys or that I'm not going to get from you guys, whatever it is. So I guess my question is through that experience, seeing Evan, you know, do his own thing or seeing Evan build his personal brand, because you guys have worked together for a long time. Like, are there any, I guess, lessons that you've taken away in terms of like how important building a personal brand is in today? Well, just talking about Evan real quick, I, I can't quite speak for him, but I mean, the reason he probably didn't leave is it's having your own personal brand is huge, like a huge, huge advantage, obviously, but there's still something to be said for working for a big company, obviously. And he worked mm-hmm. for a big company with a huge reach where he got to do, you know, whatever he wanted. And what he did was make amazing content. So there's still something to be said. The brand can only take you so far sometimes in that regard, but, but you just truly cannot overstate the importance of building your own brand. And it's really, it's a thing too. It, it doesn't have to be this selfish, like cynical thing. Either. It's mutually beneficial. It benefits the writer and it benefits the company. It's not like it's bad for the company if someone's personal brand is growing, you know, maybe even if it benefits the writer more, it's like a very mutually beneficial thing. And it can feel like dirty to talk about, but really it's everything. It really is. It comes uh, full circle. I think, I mean, if you're the reality of our industry. Yeah. If you have people that are building up, very big personal brands that are well known and you know positive personal brands and they're associated with your brand that gives you you know a much better light exactly. and shed on, on on your company so i mean the way i look at it, it's like personal brand is definitely like one of those buzzwords that gets thrown around and gets a bad connotation yeah it's kind of like lost meaning and the meaning it does have can be negative often like we did like you just said yeah i think personal brand the way i look at personal brand is you have a message no matter who you are you have a message and the way you deliver it like the way people think about you when they think of, of pat when they think of me what do you think of? That's what I think of personal brand because most people think of personal brand. They think of like taking like really corny pictures and posting it on Instagram, yeah. like, you know, yeah. personal brand. I'm like, yo, that, that is corny. Like I hate that about my generation, but I think the people that are doing personal brand correctly, those people give themselves the biggest leverage in the world because you could pivot off and probably do whatever you want. I mean, fantasy related, but also in, in any kind of industry. Hopefully, I mean, may, hopefully I don't have to put that to the test anytime soon, but I hope that's true. Hey, listen, uh, my we, Twitter got, brand we got room over here, baby. We got room. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on my Twitter brand uh, means maybe too much to me. Uh, I really am obsessed with Twitter. Yeah. So I really hope that is true though. It's a fun platform. I was like born, unfortunately, for better words, I basically thought in tweets before like Twitter even existed. Like I just like think in tweets. One um, of my friends, shout out to Animal. He just bought, he bought a notebook like two days ago. And he sends a picture of it to, to like me and my friends. And he writes down a thought. I can't remember what it was. It was like the dumbest thing. It was like 55 characters long. And I was like, he's like, I just, I'm a genius. Look what I created. Like this, this think pad or whatever. I was like, yo, you just literally made a handmade Twitter. Don't waste my time with this shit. That's like when Silicon Valley, like accidentally invents buses, which has happened many times. Uh, that's a, <laughs> kind of an obscure Twitter joke, but there've been several like proposals over the years, for, like a tech company, will unveil what they say is like some revolutionary new like transport concept and it's usually just buses. Um, I've, I've never, yeah. I've, I've never seen this before, yeah. but it's, it's the least surprising thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Twitter's a great platform. Uh, I'm actually almost to the point where I'm sick of it when it comes to our industry because it's just, yeah. like, just takes after takes after takes. And it's like, I don't know. I just, I can't even, it's too saturated to the point where I can't enjoy anything that's going on on my timeline anymore. Twitter has definitely reached maximum Twitterness. Um, <laughs> yeah. The most joy I get from it these days is putting my thoughts out there and like seeing if like anyone likes them. It's, it's gotten harder to have meaningful back and forth there's no there's no debating that yeah i don't even try to jump into like threads that people are yeah, arguing about football it's, it's, it's out of gotten, control i'm interested like if you were to start your own youtube channel would you be allowed to do that i actually don't know i think maybe uh Fire. we have a pretty not restrictive uh contract type of thing uh i'm actually just an at will employee uh, if anyone out there in the industry is wondering um <laughs> i didn't mean that as like uh come hire come me, get just, me yeah <laughs> that's no, what i thought no. i was like Pat. NBC bosses, that is literally not at all what I meant. I just meant if they ain't wondering. watching this shit, don't worry. Yeah, they didn't. In case people are wondering, though, if I'm just like a normal employee, I don't have a contract, is what I was trying to say. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we can, we have pretty great leeway, less leeway, like when it comes to football, but like I, I can do kind of like whatever I want, except for when it comes to football. 
obviously they expect my football stuff uh, to be on Rotor World. Very understandable on their behalf. Uh, you could that say. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I, I think is a little bit not understandable on their behalf, and again, tell me if I'm going too far with the Rotor World, but you guys, uh, you guys actually won an award this year at the FSGA, the best print publication for the fantasy football guide that you guys put out and it is available electronically on your website and i purchased access to it before and it's a very like thorough you know comprehensive good piece of knowledge you know going into your draft or whatnot but you guys still do it i mean it still goes out to 7-elevens and things like that correct hudson news at the airport yes <laughs> all uh, the best all the elite places <laughs> yes okay barnes and noble so in terms of uh like okay Producing the content, maybe just draft guide aside, but you know, all of the blogs that you guys do, the videos that you guys make, the podcasts that you do, are you guys solely responsible for coming up with the actual content itself? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, we're, they're, we're guided in their suggestions. But, you know, Roto World's kind of like a well-oiled machine. Uh, it's not like we do the exact same thing every year, but I mean, there are obviously certain things people expect of Roto World every mm -hmm. year. So it's pretty self-evident what to do most of the time. And you know, we are, I mean, it wasn't just Evan who gets to do, who got to do whatever he wanted. I mean, it's pretty great. You know, as long as you're not like not doing anything or, you know, as long as you're not doing something bad, I mean, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Like, we have free reign to kind of put out whatever content we want. And uh, it's a pretty amazing thing, to be honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the, the thinking behind the draft guy. When does the, the physical copy come out? Like early July, and so are you. Are you basically saying why do we still do a physical magazine? <laughs> yes, yes, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> well, for it's my understanding, you might be surprised. I believe the physical part still does make money. It's kind of like a prestige thing. I don't know. It's nice to have a magazine out there still, and just even in my personal experience, I mean, you would be shocked at the number of people. So, like, we're in like the hardcore fantasy bubble. Obviously, mm -hmm. like we're members of fantasy Twitter. Like, this is like our everyday life. I feel like, you know, the vast majority of people who play fantasy, though, are very casual. And you would be shocked at the number of people who still show up at just drafts I'm in with, like, physical magazines. Uh, Me too. Not Some like, of my best friends, like, know that yeah. I do this shit, and they still show up with yeah, the physical Yeah, so it's magazine. not, like, as dead of an art as you would maybe believe or expect. I mean, I obviously, I'm not really using a physical magazine ever. But, uh, yeah, there's still a gigantic market for it, basically, is why we do it. And people still lots of people who just want to consume it that way so you know a lot of people just don't even you know they don't want to subscribe to something online they just want to buy a magazine once they don't have to worry about subscribing to something and uh so yeah there's still a very surprisingly large market for a physical magazine yeah it's not even i wouldn't even knock you guys for doing it considering there definitely is a market for that and there's money in that for sure because you guys also do the ele electronic thing if it was like one or the other where you only yeah. did the print and didn't do the electronic i'd be like pat like if we only did print what are we, we talking like, about if we're like the guy on the dock wiping his hands off gif you know uh, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> we are updating it all summer yes so it'd be a very bold move to only do print so the d the difference though between the i mean the problem i have with the physical ones is that it releases early july and there are just you know, so many takes to be had by the time july and august it's outdated. Are, are finished with. It's outdated. Yeah, it, it's outdated. So it's like the, the difference between the electronic version of it and the physical version of it have to be com two completely different copies, right? It's not like we're, but yeah, it's the, at the end of the day, it's not like though we're like tricking some people into reading print over digital. It's just, these are people that wouldn't read it if it wasn't in print. So it's there for them. Do they get access to the electronic guide? Like when they buy the physical one, is there like on, on page one, like go to sign in on whatever? I actually, there is not. Uh, no? So, so uh, that's maybe a good idea. Maybe I should propose some synergy there. Uh, that would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? Online, you can. When you order the magazine online, there is a package. But yeah, if you're just like in the Hudson News or whatever, there's not like a barcode that you can go type in or whatever. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was just kind of curious. Very I'm, good idea. To be I'm very, I'm very curious about like the inner work. I've never worked. I mean, I've worked at actual companies before, but they're always like marketing agencies or something like that. I've obviously never worked at a big fantasy football company. So when I die, when I pry in on like Roto World, and I did the same thing with Mike on Fantasy Pros, it's totally not to like take digs at you guys. It's more. No, absolutely. I'm, absolutely. I'm super interested in, in in like knowing it and stealing all your secrets and, <laughs> making, and making them my own. Hey, now, the secret uh, to steal from us, do a print magazine. Lose Evan Silva and do a print magazine. All right. Well, I can't do the first thing because I, <laughs> I don't think I have Evan Silva, but I'll do print magazine. I could sell them right outside my window and throw them at people walking down the streets in Brooklyn. All right. So we talked about Roto Pat. We talked about Roto World. Dynamics behind a big company like themselves, especially being owned by NBC, which is very, very interesting deep dive to get into because 
most people who are in the industry, they start their own blog, right? They you know, come to fantasy, elitefantasy.com. And I'm sure I feel like someone who watches this probably owns that domain. They're like, hey, I'm sure they do. Shout out to me. Yeah. But <laughs> so it, it's interesting to hear this side of this stuff because most people are doing this as a hobby or they're doing it just starting their own blog or their own YouTube channel. So it's cool to hear the inner workings of, of a company like Roto World. So thank you for sharing that. Now, as we wrap up, we like to we like to hit the guests with a couple of random questions. And oh boy. again, I will always preface this by saying I stole this question from Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. He asks everyone that he interviews in the book, the best purchase you have made under one hundred dollars. The best purchase I've ever. And you're not made. allowed to say the Roto World magazine. <laughs> yeah, gonna say, I'm not that much of a, a shameless shill. Oh man, I did not think about this before the podcast. Uh, I'm going to peel back the curtain on myself a little bit. Uh, I'm only, I'm 33, so I'm not that old, but I'm not like young anymore. And I'm kind of a Luddite. I buy CDs. I had such a huge CD collection when I was, when I was a young man, like in my teens, early 20s. I just like decided I wasn't going to stop, even though it was already, uh, you know, anachristic back then even. I just decided like I wanted it to like be my collection. And so my best purchase under a hundred dollars is just like every CD that I am still buying because <laughs> I have like this massive CD collection and it's honestly like my crown jewel possession. It's like my pride and joy. And so like, I love buying CDs and that's like my collection and uh, that's my best purchase under a hundred dollars. I'm a big fan of that. You know what I love? I love walking into a friend's house and they have a rack of DVDs. I don't know why and we'll never watch them, but it makes me feel like very at home. I'm like, cool. Like maybe we'll just like hang out and watch movies and shit, you know? I still, I will still even occasionally buy DVDs. I feel like something that we are very much losing on it. Like I just like having physical things. You know, you can say like a lot of it is junk, but I think we might kind of all regret in like 20, 30 years, like no one owns physical music anymore. No one owns physical movies. Books are hanging on pretty well, but like if no one owns books, uh, maybe I'll be proven wrong and it's just like it was all this materialistic trash we never needed to have. No, eventually I, everything, we're just going to have everything like on this. Yeah. Like this is going to be every movie, book, and CD that was ever created. Just yeah, right and I feel like people are going to miss or you know, people who don't even know, there'll be some void that they, they don't know. Like this, like there's something to be said for me for physically owning this. Now, what will happen, I think, what I've, what I've learned, one of the things I've learned from living in Brooklyn is that if you want to be stylish, just wait for something to go really out of style. And yes. that's, that's when you buy it because that's when it will come back in. So I think everything that is like retro, I'm not really, I haven't done the research on the exact number of years in which it starts to come back, but everything that becomes retro at one point becomes very popular. And then, then once it becomes popular, it becomes mainstream. Then all the hipsters that started in the beginning will stop buying it. It's a cycle of things. So I think we yeah. will see CDs and DVDs and things come back, but it's only going to be like a, a niche thing for a second and then probably come back out. But I do yeah. like that as a purchase. Yeah. Someone who lives in Brooklyn, I'm sure, you know, cassettes are having a moment. And so if even like cassettes can have a moment, I'm assuming CDs will have a moment. They're coming back eventually. Where do you even, do you listen to any of them though? Uh, well, I, shot, I had a car until last summer that uh, had a CD player in it. I do no longer. So I'm like a true, so I just, I rip them on my computer and I uh, yeah, listen <laughs> on my phone, listen on my computer. I just grew up in a family, like my dad had a huge record collection. Then he had a huge CD collection. So I kind of like grew up in that culture and like, I just always wanted to have physical music somehow. And I've never really as an adult, like listened to like CD, you know, I've always had an, I've had an iPod since 2003 or whatever, you know, yeah. um, I've had a laptop since 2005. So that's where I've always done the vast majority of my listening, but I just like to have them around. I feel that. Yeah. I don't know why I have this like innate respect for people that have like a huge collection of, you know, vinyl or whatever it is. So I, I dig the answer. All right. Last one. Last one. Bold prediction for the future of the fantasy football industry. Now, not necessarily. And you can't say that, you know, print magazines are coming back. Not not players or anything like that. I want I want predictions for the industry. I don't care if it's content related or personnel related, whatever, whatever it is you got on the dome. Well, it's almost like the opposite of a bold prediction, but I feel like, so like the industry, you know, has like been in this period of like nonstop growth and will continue to grow because, you know, DFS is growing. Gambling is now becoming legal and, you know, it's fantasy adjacent. So like, I don't envision the industry, the growth slowing down anytime soon, but my bold prediction might be just that like regular season long fantasy 
still remains like by far the most popular, okay. most played, and, like takes up like 90 to 95% probably of like the bandwidth. And that's another thing in our little Twitter bubble can be hard. There's such an emphasis on DFS, you know, we're amongst like the most hardcore people in the DFS community. And, but at the end of the day, DFS is still like very small compared to like the season long fantasy uh, crew that's out there. My bold prediction just, is that it's probably just going to stay that way. And uh, the other stuff is not going to go away and it's going to have like really engaged hardcore audiences. But like, I don't think it's going to come at the expense of like regular old, good old fashioned season long fantasy. Yeah. I'm with you. I think at the, at the core of fantasy football, like it'll always go back to be an engagement game. Like your friends. Yeah, and your it's family not camaraderie. Play. It's like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And all these other, you know, niche things are cool. Like it's great that everyone, again, it goes back to what we were talking about way earlier in the conversation about things being more and more and more personalized. And I've used this analogy before, but like, if you think of any industry, think of like the fitness industry, right? Like 30, 40 years ago or whatever, it was just like, you either did weights or you did <laughs> running, right? It was like, that was yes. fitness. And at, now we're like, there's, I can walk down my my block in Brooklyn and find seven different niche fitness places, yoga, hot yoga, cold yoga, fucking on a mountain yoga. And it's like, <laughs> like there's goat yoga. There's legitimately goat yoga and yes, you put I've goats on your it. back. Yeah. And, and it's like, it, because people want everything personalized and that's the way the fantasy is like low key going, right? We have best ball for people that don't want to manage teams inside the season. We have DFS for people that don't care about drafting and they only care about like winning money. So I, I would agree with you though. At the core of everything, it's season long and then everything kind of falls to the wayside as as niche products. Well said. Well said. Mwah. All right. Well, that will wrap up this episode of uh, Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. As always, all we ask is that if you found any of the information today valuable or entertaining or informational, that you share this interview amongst your friends or enemies, whatever you got to do out there. Make sure that you are your following frenemies. your friend. Yeah, anyone in between that. Make sure you're following Pat. On uh, Twitter, all of his information will be linked down below. Pat, are you an Instagram guy? I I am, but I, it's not like a professional Instagram. I don't have a private Instagram, but I don't promote my Instagram. Like obscure pictures, basically. And usually just like when I'm on the road, which is quite often. But I, I don't have like a, a weaponized Instagram. It's like my one social media platform is still just like amongst me and my friends, basically. I am out there, though. Okay. Well, I will link that down below as well. So anything related to Rotopat, you will be able to find in the description. So make sure you're following him and we will see you uh, next week. I believe we have Scott Fish coming on. So that will be another good guest. Yeah, this is uh, truly my pleasure, by the way. Uh, I learned a lot, to be frank. Um, so. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that, but it was uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking to you. And I, I look forward to, you know, you're one of the few people that I actually look forward to interacting with in the future on Twitter. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Same. Same. Later, guys. Hey! Hey!